We've been in a series uh, on the book of James called Dead or Alive. How many of you have been enjoying this series so far? I love the book of James, personally. Uh, Martin Luther had some issues with it, but I really love the book of James. It's powerful. I think it, I think it has a lot to say to this generation and this culture. I think it has a lot of, uh, in a lot of ways, it flies in the face of a lot of what, what the popular narrative is, and I love it when Scripture does that. I love being challenged. I love reading the scriptures, and, and it, I love when it stings a little bit. I didn't get a lot of amens. So y- y- y'all like to read the scriptures and just, and just make it fit into all of your little opinions? I don't like that personally. It doesn't do anything for me. I like when, I like when the scripture disagrees with an opinion I have, and then, it, and then that's the opportunity that I have to come into submission. Because if the scriptures just agree with everything that you have, then you never have to be submitted, and then obedience doesn't mean anything. If you only obey the parts of the scriptures that happen to align with your opinion, you are not a follower of Jesus. I'm sorry, but that's not following Jesus. That's just going to a buffet and grabbing whatever fits you and then worshiping yourself. That's not what this sermon is on. And I better get to it before I, before I offend some people. It's 9.09 and I'm, I'm, I'm feeling I'm on one this morning and I, I don't want to cause any unnecessary emails. If there are necessary emails, praise the Lord, bring them on. I don't want to unnecessarily step on anyone's toes, but I will step on your toes if it's necessary. I don't mind doing that. James. James chapter 5 is what we'll be talking about today. This is the last sermon in this series. Uh, We'll be closing it up. This is the end of this book. If you're taking notes, this sermon is called Go Again. Now, I want to give a little bit of a refresher on the background of, uh, of the book of James because sometimes we can like forget along the way. So James is known as, as one of the universal letters or the general letters, which means that it wasn't written to a particular city or a particular church, but it was written to believers in a wide span, a, a wide area. Okay, It was written by a guy named James, big surprise, but maybe not the James that you were thinking, not James, the brother of John, the sons of thunder, you know, but actually James, the brother of Jesus, who wasn't actually a believer in Jesus during during Jesus' earthly ministry, but after he died and rose again, James, his own brother, wow, crazy, he was converted and then he became the bishop of Jerusalem and became one of the most authoritative voices in the New Testament church. Isn't that cool? Isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting? Some of you are like, nope. And I'm like, well, that's okay. This letter is, is, is known for its focus on good works. And all the, all the people, the air left their lungs and they went, oh my gosh, he said a cuss word. He said good works. Actually, good works is, uh, they're not a cuss word. Good is actually written into it. It's actually good works are a very good thing. You know, I heard this this quote recently that I really resonated with me. God isn't against effort. He's against earning. Did you hear that? God isn't against effort. He's against earning. Because the good works, they, they, they don't come first. They come from overflow. You see, people like to pit the theology of James versus the theology of Paul, which we know is salvation by faith, you know, grace and faith. But Paul and James don't actually disagree with each other. You see, Paul and James would both agree that it, is, that it is faith in Jesus that saves, but they would also both agree that faith in Jesus eventually looks like something. Oh, wait, you mean actually, you mean that, that when I believe that something has to change inside of me? It's not so much have to, it's just kind of, it's kind of like gravity. It's not like a law like, hey, if you believe in Jesus, you better change. It's more like, if I drop this baseball, it's going to hit the floor. If you believe in Jesus, you will be transformed. If you don't agree with it, that's fine, but you're in disagreement with Paul and with James. In chapter 5, James takes on three subjects. He warns rich people about the abuse of that position, the abuse of the power that comes with wealth. He warns or he encourages patience in the midst of suffering. And then there's this section near the end that talks about prayer and it also talks about confession. And all the Protestants went, ooh. Some of you who don't know church history, you're just like, like, what are you talking about? We're going to talk about prayer and confession. Confession isn't just for Catholics, y'all. Now, there was a pendulum that swung in Catholicism where you had to confess to a specific person and it was very official and so on and so forth. But then the Protestants swing all the way over here and be like, I don't got to tell anybody about anything. I just keep this between me and God, just our little personal relationship. 
There is, there, you know, there is a balance where you don't have to go and confess to a priest and be absolved in an official capacity, but you also should talk to somebody about your stuff. Did you know that? Well, we're going to read about it. Would you stand with me for the reading of the word? James chapter 5, starting in verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone among you cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Wow, that is really interesting. I'm going to read that scripture again. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Another translation says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Did you like my little ith in there? We got some KJV. I know Tori Lynn appreciated that. <laughs> Elijah, this kind of feels like it's out of nowhere, but in verse 17, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. We've got an Elijah in the house. Love you, Elijah. I see Elijah, he's, this is his last weekend with us before he goes, he goes on mission. He is in leadership at YWAM. And I'm telling you, this is a gift to the body of Christ, not just heart of the city church. This is a leader who leads with zeal. You, pr- you might not have a chance to get to know him because he's only going to be you know, here for like a little bit longer. But I'm telling you, if you have a chance to follow this young man's life, he is absolutely marked. You are absolutely marked. I believe that I heard the Lord say this morning, Elijah, when we were praying over you, that um, I, I heard the scripture was like, if my people will humble themselves and they will pray, I will hear them and, and, and I, I, will, I will heal their land. And I, and I, but I heard God personalize it for you. Elijah, when you humble yourself and you pray, there is something about the authority in your desperation that God hears your prayers. Now, I, he hears our prayers, but he hears your prayers, Elijah. Never, under, uh, never underestimate the power of your prayers. I, I, just, I just felt this whole weekend that I was supposed to tell you there is such power in your desperation. It's something for you to impart to other people. The zeal, of course, we all know you're very zealous, but there's something about your prayer life. He hears your desperation, Elijah. I hope, I, I know this is selfish, but I hope you would pray for me because then my life's gonna change, <laughs> my goodness. I love this young man. Anyway, we're talking about a different Elijah today, but I, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and earth bore its fruit. Now, James doesn't have to give a lot of context for this Elijah guy, because in Jewish culture, Elijah would have been one of the most prominent, one of the most famous figures in all of Jewish history. When it comes to prophets, he would be known probably second only to Moses. See, Elijah was famous for coming against the idolatry of a, of, of a king named Ahab and a queen named Jezebel. I don't know. There's just something about that name that just, it's kind of just, well, I don't, I don't know. She was, she was a scary lady. I mean, even Elijah got scared of her. That's a different story, though. And so one of the things that famously occurred in his ministry is Elijah prayed, and then a drought came to the land. Now, Elijah, please don't go praying for droughts unless the Lord really, you're sure that he tells you to. I would have to be sure. (laughs) Drought? But then three and a half years later, he prays again and the drought ends. Really, really miraculous ministry that this this Elijah prophet guy operated in. Now, we're going to read from 1 Kings chapter 18, starting in verse 41, and we're going to hear a little bit more about what James is referring to in chapter 5. 1 Kings 18, starting in verse 41. Sorry, I kept you standing, but I'm not that sorry because I'm going to have you keep standing until we read the end of this. And Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of the rushing of rain. Another translation says there is the sound of the abundance of rain. So Ahab went, mind you, the drought is still intact in this time when Elijah said that. The drought is still intact. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink and Elijah went to the top of Mount Carmel and he bowed himself down on the earth and put his face between his knees in an uncomfortable position, I would imagine. I don't even know if I can do that. 
And he said to his servants, go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, there is nothing. And he said, go again, seven times. And at the seventh time, he said, behold, a little cloud, emphasis, mine. Uh, that's not really that funny unless you like read a lot and you see like when people are quoting and they say emphasis mine. Maybe it's still not funny. Let's move on. <laughs> I know my 909 people are my readers and not even they laughed. So maybe it just wasn't very good to say. <laughs> Behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. And he said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down lest the rain stop you. And in a little while, the heavens grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. Go ahead and be seated. Do you love God's word? Me too. Do you read God's word every day? You know what? That was a lot of yeses. 909, I see you. I see you, Bible readers. I see you get up in the morning earlier and, and pray and read. I love that. If you read the Bible every day, I promise you, you won't be the same. I promise you, guarantee, if you read the Bible every day, you will not be the same as before. Can't. Doesn't happen. How many of you have ever been disappointed before? Really? Some of y'all been walking through life. (laughs) Never disappointed. Everything's going to go my way. What is that from? I don't don't even know what that's from. Is that right? Okay. (laughs) Praise God. I've been disappointed quite a few times in my life. Um, I can remember one, one, one kind of season in particular where I battled disappointment a lot. It wasn't the most painful season of my life. It wasn't the most hurt or the deepest disappointment that I've experienced. But what was different about it, it was a disappointment that had the potential to change my future. I'm going to give a little bit of backstory. Ever since I was a very young child, since I knew English well enough to understand what the word marriage and what the word parenthood meant, that is what I have wanted in my life. That's been my aspiration throughout life. It's like, people are like, what do you want to do when you grow up? I want to be a husband and I want to be a dad. No, but like for work, it's like, well, I could do quite a few different things, but I want to be a husband and I want to be a dad. You know, a lot of kids, they go through this season, you know, where it's like uh, the opposite sex has cooties. Yeah, not for me. That never existed for me. I remember being in kindergarten and the boys were like, girls have cooties. I'm like, you are crazy. You are crazy. You don't want to hang out with the girls? I never understood it. It never made any sense to me. You see, my parents had set such an amazing example, these two people right here. They had set such an amazing example of what what marriage and parenthood looked like. And all I knew is that I wanted that. (sighs) For all my life. And, uh, I, but I came to this season of life uh, when I was a younger man, because I know a lot of you would be like, Seth, you're a young man. And I, I guess I am. And, and I mean, it's all relative, but I mean, all of you are young too compared to like God, but we'll just. <laughs> I'm a young man. <laughs> but when I was a younger man, <laughs> <clears throat> when I was a younger man, I went through this season where. I really questioned if God had that for me or if I even wanted anything to do with it. Now, I, I, I want to make something very clear. I do not believe that every Christian, every follower of Jesus is called to marriage and parenthood. There is a 100% legitimate lifetime calling of singleness within Christianity. I don't know if you knew that, but that's one of those things that the pendulum has maybe swung a little out of balance. Paul makes it very clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that lifelong singlehood is an absolutely legitimate call within Christianity. Now, that being said, that's not what was happening to me during this season. What was happening to me is not a call to singlehood, thank you, Jesus, because that wasn't for me personally. What was happening was that I had become so disappointed 
from failed relationship after failed relationship after failed relationship that I began to buy into something that, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe God doesn't have that for me. And the problem was that I almost let disappointment rob me of something that God had been preparing for me. Now that season ended on an early summer evening. I'll never forget it on the corner of 10th and Mountain. June 23rd, 2012, I walk up onto the porch of my dear friend, and there's this girl, blonde dreadlocks, absolutely blew me away when I saw her. I just was like, what in the world? God, you make them like this? I didn't know. And the Lord used the, the lady that would become my wife uh, to, really, to really change my heart and reawaken this dream that he had placed in me from a, from a very young age. And now I am a husband and I am a daddy. Ugh. But I almost let disappointment rob me of that. Some of you might be like, well, that was... That's cute, Seth. I've experienced way deeper disappointment in my life, and, and I have too. But I, I remember this specific time that I almost let disappointment rob me of part of my destiny. And that's what I want to talk to you about because disappointment is very powerful. Proverbs 13, 12 says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. And I believe that there's people in the room today that their hearts have been made very, very sick because of hope deferred, because of disappointment. Let me tell you something. Hope deferred and heart sickness that doesn't get dealt with will lead us to some very dark places in life when we don't deal with heart sickness. Now, I want to talk to you about a, a couple different areas. I mentioned earlier that, that people experience disappointment that I have seen in my own life and with others, and that is prayer and confession. Now in prayer, you might expect, many people experience disappointment in prayer because of requests that they have made that have not come to pass. Am I the only one? Now some of the prayers that I have made requests and they have not come to pass, I look back and I go, oh my goodness, thank you Lord for not answering that prayer. Because we pray some pretty knuckle-headed prayers sometimes, y'all. Or is it just me again? No. I have prayed for things and I go, Lord, I don't know what I was thinking. He's like, I got your back. <laughs> That's a no. <laughs> but maybe, maybe you've prayed for something that is good and you haven't seen it come to pass. Maybe it was you prayed for someone who was sick and they still passed away. You been there? I've been there. Maybe it was you prayed for someone who was caught up in addiction and they kept going back time and time again. Maybe it was you prayed for your marriage and your spouse walked out. Maybe, it, maybe, maybe you prayed for a family member or, or a close friend that they would encounter Jesus and their heart has continued to remain hardened toward him. Whatever it is, when we experience disappointment in this area, and we don't get healing, and we don't deal with it, when it goes unaddressed, a lot of times there are two paths that people go down with this disappointment. One of them, real bad. They stop praying. That's not where you want to be. But the other path is also dangerous, and that is that we keep praying, but we adjust our theology in order to rationalize the prayers that have been unanswered. And I'm telling you that that is a dangerous road to walk because what happens when we adjust the way that we view God and his word based on our disappointment, then what we begin to do is we begin to worship an idea that we have created that has been fashioned by pain, no longer worshiping the God of the universe, but a figure, if you will, an idol made by pain. It's a dangerous place to be. Have you let pain shape your perception of God? And are you praying to that thing now? 
This other area where I've seen people experience this kind of disappointment is in confession. You know, maybe, um, maybe you confess something really, really personal to someone before. You confess sin to a brother or sister in the Lord, and they immediately came unglued on you, just exploded on you because it was just too bad. Maybe, maybe you told them and you thought that they were a safe place and then they went and gossiped about you. Or maybe they told you that they would walk with you and keep you accountable and they left you high and dry. You see, this kind of disappointment will often lead someone to, to start justifying hidden sin and even justifying a lifestyle of hidden sin. Do you feel me? Because look, look at what we do in our heads. Well, last time I tried to bring someone into the bridge, last, last time I tried to practice confession, it didn't go well for me. And so now it's okay for me to just continue in this. And I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna stay chained up. Did you know? Did you know that when you expose darkness to light, it loses its power? But when you let darkness stay dark, that it continues to hold its grip on us. And if we let disappointment if we let disappointment de determine that we're going to keep the darkness in the dark, that's exactly what happens. The other thing that this kind of disappointment will lead to is basically a shallow life. Where you stop letting people in. You stop building real deep relationships because they just done hurt you too many times. I'm no longer going to enter into real intimate friendship relationship because they, I've just been betrayed too many times. And you get robbed of a huge part of the meaning of life. The whole reason that we are here. When you refuse to go deep because of pain with other people, it's like you're missing half the picture of the purpose of humanity. Now, what I want to tell you is that if you've experienced, if you've experienced disappointment in either of these areas, that you are not alone. You can rest assured that you are surrounded by people who have shared in that disappointment. That's one of the things that disappointment can do. It can make us feel completely isolated. No one's been disappointed like I have, Seth. That is exactly what the enemy of your soul would want you to believe. No one has experienced disappointed like me, Seth. I, I, I can't even bring someone into it. No one can resonate with what I've experienced. So you isolate and then you don't grow and you stay in chains. Do you know how many times that I have prayed and I don't see it come to fruition? I've sat at the foot of a friend's bed, dying of cancer, praying with everything that I have every bit of faith that I can muster. And you know what happened? They passed away. And then they pass away, so I pray for them to be raised from the dead. Some of you are like, ooh, that's spooky. It's just the Bible. <laughs> and you know what happened? They didn't come back. I know, what it's, I know what it's like to be disappointed. Right, yeah, I mean, they're going to be resurrected on the last day. But I, I know what that feels like, and I know what it's like to tell people, to let people in to your personal, very, very intimate place, stuff from your life, information, and then for them to betray you in some way, whether it's from telling other people or just blowing up on you. I've been betrayed in that way. You are not alone. And I think that we even have someone who can empathize with us in the scriptures. See, in First Corinthians, I'm sorry, in First Kings chapter 18, sometimes we can read over this story of Elijah and we can sanitize it and we can turn it into a little flannel board. Y'all went to Sunday school? You remember flannel boards? See, when, uh, there's nothing wrong with flannel boards. They're a good learning tool. But when you turn the Bible stories into little sanitized flannel boards and you assume that everything just went hunky-dory and peachy for these people, you can disconnect from it. Let me just take us back through 1 Kings chapter 18 and the experience that Elijah had. First of all, think about it. 
in verse 41, Elijah had so much faith. He had so much faith. He goes, now we're in a drought for three and a half years, remember. And he says, Ahab, go eat and drink because I hear the sound of rushing rain. What do you hear, Elijah? Yeah, go. I wonder, is there that kind of faith in the house today? The kind of faith that begins to step out and act upon the thing that you are believing for before you see the manifestation. A lot of us, we start acting after we see the beginning of the manifestation, we go, I am of great faith. Doesn't take a whole lot of faith. You see, someone, someone told me once, and I think it's a little bit shaky, but I'll just say it anyway because I think that it illustrates a good point. They said the opposite of faith is not fear. The opposite of faith is sight. Now, it's, we're not going to say, that's not the scriptures necessarily, but, he, but, but it was taken from the scriptures. We operate by faith, not by sight. Sometimes what we're being called to is to shift our behavior toward what we are believing for before we see the manifestation. And that's exactly what Elijah did in this situation. Nevertheless, in verse 42, he goes up the mountain, gets on the ground, and begins to pray in that very uncomfortable position. Now, verse 43 is the kicker, and this is where I want us to slow down and not skim over it because it's too easy to do that. He told his servant to go and look toward the sea. There's nothing. Go again. There's nothing. Go again. Nothing. Go again. Nothing. Go again. And it wasn't until the seventh time that the servant began to see the beginning of a manifestation, some shred of evidence that the drought was going to end. And what was that shred of evidence? Verse 44, it says that he saw a cloud, a small cloud, little cloud, little cloud, like a man's hand. Now, I don't know about you, but I've seen a lot of clouds in my life. And if I saw a cloud like a man's hand, I'm not thinking that rain is coming. I mean, I see humongous billowing clouds pass by all the time. And I'm like, that's a nice cloud. Ain't no rain coming from that. Especially if it had been a drought for three and a half years. But again, Elijah steps out of the boat. You know what that term means? It's a reference to Peter stepping out of the boat when Jesus called him to the water. He steps out of the boat and he says, servant. I don't know if he called him servant. Servant had a name. I'm sure he referred to him by name. Servant. Go tell Ahab he better get going just in case the rain stops him. Now, let's just think about this for a minute. Three and a half years, no rain. A cloud like a man's hand. And Elijah wants to warn Ahab because not only is rain coming, not only is he believing that the drought is ending, but he believes that rain is coming that is going to inhibit transportation. We're talking flash flood status. We're talking about chariots getting caught up in the mud status. That rhymed. (laughs) On accident. (laughs) Finally, in verse 45, it says, a little while later, the heavens grew black with clouds and wind, and there was great rain. I want to encourage you not to detach yourself from this passage. Think about this. Can, can, Can we put ourselves in the shoes of Elijah for one minute? One minute, let's put ourselves in the shoes of Elijah. Or how, how about the shoes of his servant? We don't even know what kind of faith the servant had. Elijah was believing for something, but can you imagine being the servant? Go to the sea. Oh, oh yeah, totally. Nothing. Go again. Oh, go again. Elijah, it's been a drought for three and a half years, man. You're the one who prayed this thing in. You know what it's about. We don't know how much time elapsed between those seven attempts. It's one sentence. So for us, it's like, la-di-da, seven attempts, the rain came, nice little Bible story. I don't really think it went like that. We don't know how far the distance was for the servant to go get a good view of the sea. We don't know that. Because again, it's like one little sentence. We go, oh, he just had to take his little, you know, Elijah must have been sitting down behind a bush so he couldn't see the sea. So the servant had to just stand up, take two steps and be able to see. We don't know that. We don't know what kind of inner turmoil that Elijah was facing as he continued to believe the Lord, even though he did not see a shred of evidence that God was coming through. 
a shred of evidence that God was coming through. We're talking about seven attempts before the littlest manifestation that God might be bringing rain. It reminds me of this story that Jesus told. It was a parable from Luke 18. It goes like this. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, first of all, this guy should check himself before he wrecks himself. I don't, I mean, who who says that? Granted, it's a parable. Okay, so. Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. Dramatic much, Mr. Ruler? Beat you down by her continual coming? Obviously, Jesus is painting the picture of a weird dude. And the Lord said, hear what this unrighteous judge says. And will not God, who is not the unrighteous judge, will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, check this one. Check this one, 21st century American church. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Will he find faith on earth? And it says that Jesus told this parable in order that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. See, I was, as I was preparing this week, I tried to go into this message like I normally would. I'm going to teach from the scriptures. But for whatever reason, God wouldn't let me teach this week. No, I, I believe I heard the Lord say, Seth, there's people in the room that are going to be in the room this weekend that just like Elijah said to his servant, that my word to them is, go again. Go again. Seth, I was suffering and I prayed just like James says. I was suffering and I prayed and I'm still suffering. Go again. You see, you see, Seth, I had the elders lay hands on me and anoint me with oil and I haven't seen any change. Go again. Uh, but, but Seth, you, you see, I, I, I actually confessed my sin. Every time I've confessed my sin to a brother or sister, it has only added pain to my life. Go again. You know, I've tried to walk in righteousness. I've tried to follow the Lord and I've prayed fervently with everything that I have and I don't see any power in my prayer. Go again. See, but I laid hands on the sick and I didn't see God raise them up. Go again. That's what I believe that the word of the Lord is to you today, church. That there's some people who've been walking with the Lord for a long time, but you've reshaped him in your mind and your heart in order to cope with the experiences that you have had. But Seth, why didn't it go better the first time? I don't know. But but like, if God's good and he's all powerful, why doesn't he just fix it? I don't know. Why does it seem like God cares so much about persistence? I don't know. There are a lot of whys that will keep you from going again if you will let them. There are a lot of whys that will keep you from going again if you will let them. You see, one of my heroes in the faith, um, one of my heroes in the faith, his wife passed away recently. His name's Bill Johnson. And um, the Sunday directly following his wife's passing from cancer, he preached a message called breaking the bread of my soul and it's one of the most profound powerful messages i've ever heard in my life like i could hardly believe my ears it was like it was like i was i don't know how to describe it It it's like i was hearing directly from the heart of god and he said this thing that has stuck with me ever since that I, i i haven't been able to shake it and it's this the level of revelation god gives you will always be equal to the measure of mystery you're willing to you're willing to live with 
And then he goes on and he says this, and the inability to live with mystery is your resistance to childlikeness. I'm gonna say it again. It's a little stingy. If you really get it, it's stingy. It's stingy for me right now. The level of revelation God gives you will always be equal to the measure of mystery you're willing to live with. And the inability to live with mystery is your resistance to childlikeness. I don't share that quote with you today to beat anyone over the head with it. Because if there is anyone who is guilty of resistance to childlikeness, it is me. If there is anyone who needs a perfect explanation for every little dot and tittle, it is me. I am the chief among sinners for needing an explanation for everything, for not being content to live in the mystery. But that's exactly why I need those words to go deep into my soul. Because however you want to cut it, we serve a God who there are many mysterious things about. And that's actually a good thing. You're like, how could that be a good thing? I don't know, but it is a good thing. He's good and he's mysterious. And it's good that you can't figure him all out. There's, I, 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 there was a thing that Jesus said. He goes, I have much more to tell you, but... Basically, he's, I'm a little, little paraphrase. You can't handle it right now. Did you know that's for your good? It's for your good. I believe that God, this weekend, what he gave me was, Seth, you just need to tell them what I told you. But, but God, I really like to study the Greek and be able to explain the, you know, the behind the scenes. Is, Seth, I, I, I need you to just tell, tell them what I told you. But it doesn't feel like a teaching, Lord. Tell them what I told you. You know, like it's a little bit shorter and a little bit more direct each time that you like try to fight with God. I'm trying to teach through this and he's like, and I'm feeling nothing. I'm not, I'm not picking up anything trying to teach through this. I'm like, <gasps> he says, that the reminder that was needed for this weekend, it was an exhortation that we would not let the disappointment that we have experienced stop us from adhering to this teaching from James in chapter five, that we would pray with faith, that we would receive prayer and that we would confess our sins one to another. That we would go again, even when we have not seen the manifestation, even when we've been disappointed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times, that we would go again. Will you stand with me? See, this passage, the way that it ends is, um, I was like, thank you, Lord. It was like you just served it up for me, God. The way this passage ends, it's the end of the chapter. It's the end of the book. It's the two verses that directly follow this James 5 passage that we've been talking through. It reads like this. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. And I can't help but believe that even in this room today that there are people who have been wandering from the truth. Now, maybe that wandering is a season of wandering. Maybe there was a time when you were adhering to the truth, when you were following Jesus, when you were walking with him in restored relationship, and you have entered a season of wandering from the truth. Or maybe you have been wandering your whole life. And I believe that the invitation that God extends to you today is that your wandering would be over. And he would say, come home. I've been waiting this whole time. Now, what does this talk about death, that he would be delivered from death, saved from death? You see, in the beginning, we were created in the image of God. Just think about that for a minute. Isn't that cool? We were created in the image of God. But us being like we are, even though we were in restored relationship with Jesus, we were in good standing with God. We withheld our trust from him and rebelled against him and said, uh, I don't know about your intentions, God. I think I know what's good for me. And that rebellion and that sin created a separation. Now, Seth, why would it create a separation? Because we serve a God who is holy and he does not coexist with sin. Wow, that seems like bad news. Well, yeah, that part is bad news in a sense. 
But the other part of the news is this God who is perfectly holy is also perfectly love. And in that perfect love, he was not content to let that separation, that chasm remain. And so he made a way like only he could to come to manifest himself in person, to live a sinless life, to die to pay for all of our sin, all of our rebellion against him, even though he knew no sin. And not only did he pay the price, then after he was dead, he rose again on the third day, which pointed to our resurrection, that one which we will experience for those who believe. Did you know that? You're not just gonna be like a little floaty thing forever, that you're actually gonna be resurrected if you put your faith in Christ. This is the gospel. Now, again, Seth, why are you talking about death? What does that have to do with it? See, the wages of sin is death. And it's not just dying on this earth. That's, honestly, that's just, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Passing from this earth is just the tip of the iceberg. The wages of sin is eternal death. When we stay in our sin, we stay separated from God. And if we die in that state, that continues for eternity. But the gift of God is eternal life, right relationship with him, a new heaven, a new earth, forever and ever and ever. And how do we gain access to that gift? Well, the cool thing is it's a gift. So you you receive it. You say, yes, Jesus. You say, yes, I I put my trust in you. I trust you for the gift of eternal life. I trust you for healing. I trust you for being restored. I trust you for being reconnected to God. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. You're the Messiah. You're the Son of God. We say yes to Jesus. We put all of our trust and all of our hope in him. And so because I believe there are people in here today who have been wandering for either their entire life, wandering from the truth for their whole life or for a season, I want to give an opportunity and an invitation to come home from your wandering and to say yes to Jesus today. Would you bow your heads with me? Now, I'm going to ask you to pray with me. I'm going to lead you in a prayer so you know what you're getting into. But if you want to make that commitment today to come home from your wandering and give your life to Jesus, would you repeat this prayer with me? But you've got to, it's got to be from your heart. Because the miracle is not in the repetition. It's from the true transformation. Saints, would you pray with me as well as we stand in solidarity with these people who would make this decision today? Father, I know that I have sinned. I messed up and that we were separated. But I thank you that you made a way for us to be close again. You sent your son Jesus You came to earth in the form of a man and you lived a perfect life and you died for my sin and you were resurrected so that I might have real life. I thank you, Jesus, and I give my whole life to you. All my trust is in you and I claim Jesus Christ as Lord as Savior, as the Son of God. Whatever you want, I am all yours. In Jesus' name, amen.